Okay, so, you know, welcome to the May um, Mellastone virtual seminar. This, this month we, we postponed it a little bit or moved it a little bit due to end of the semester craziness for everybody, but, uh, you know, all the good things must wait and uh, especially true now. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to introduce Darren Pennies, who has been working on what he's going to be presenting today for eh, about 20 years. Um, Darren, um, it's uh, been working on Melanson for a long time, won't say how much, but after obtaining his PhD at the University of Florida, uh, well, previous to that, he was at uh, Connecticut, then he was uh, lived in Costa Rica, then he uh, did his PhD at the University of Florida. Then he spent a few years at the Cal Academy working on a couple of different projects with Frank Almeida. And then it has been for a few years now, what is it, five, Darren, at the University of uh, North Carolina, Wilmington. And um, Darren is one of the few people that has really tackled, seen both new world and old world melastomes. And uh, as such, he's in a unique position to be able to talk about the entire family. And that's what he's going to tell us about today. So take it away, Darren, whenever you're ready. All right. Well, thank you very much for that great introduction. Thank all of you uh, for uh, your, uh, your time, taking the time to be here today. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the new classification for the melastomes. Uh, this classification has uh, some co-authors, so uh, Frank, Marcella, Marcelo, Fabian, Renato, Peter Fritsch, and Doug Stone. Uh, this is going to be one chapter in the upcoming book on melastomes, The Systematics, Evolution, and Ecology of the Melastomatesi. I made this little mock-up of it over here. Uh, you know, I don't know what it's really going to look like, but something like this. Uh, so this book is going to be available uh, this summer, and uh, this chapter will be in the systematics section of the book, and that section is going to have, uh, besides this classification, it's going to have treatments of most of the tribes. Uh, I want to thank a lot of people who have been involved, either directly, well, mostly directly, uh, in uh, the success of this, this project. Um, all these people listed here, plus uh, many herbaria and curatorial staff, and uh, a whole series of uh, nice grants from the National Science Foundation. Uh, we should also take a moment to acknowledge just um, all of the Melosome researchers uh, going all the way back to the 18th century and then right up to the present day. Uh, we're really privileged to have such a great body of literature and knowledge uh, that's been amassed by all these folks over the years. Um, although this family is mostly unknown to most of the general public, uh, lots of melosomes have actually uh, shown up on stamps and currencies uh, around the world. Um, if you look carefully at all of these, you'll see that actually melastoma has made multiple appearances here. Um, melastoma is kind of interesting. Uh, it is a genus that still needs a lot of work. Uh, Kun Meng Wong at the Singapore Botanical Garden uh, wrote a revision of melastoma just in Borneo uh, a few years ago. And in that one treatment, he increased the number of species there from nine up to 40 with 31 new species. And the, the same sort of thing could be done with many other genera, especially in the paleotropics. So, you know, we've come a long way, but we still have far to go. So uh, today I'm going to give kind of a general overview, a brief of the family. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the results of the phylogenetic analysis that we conducted. And uh, then I'll spend most of the time, and I'm going to try to rip through this pretty quickly because we don't want to be here for two hours. <laughs> uh, I'll do a, uh, a very superficial introduction to um, the two subfamilies and 21 tribes. Uh, that we're recognizing in the new classification. But uh, for more details on all those, you can read the classification chapter of the book and then all the targeted chapters. Uh, or you can go and look at all the past 
presentations here in the seminar series or future ones. So in terms of the uh, biodiversity of the family, um, as of January 2022, when we pretty much uh, put a moratorium on numbers for the book, uh, this is where, <clears throat> where things stood. Uh, we have globally uh, three subfamilies, 21 tribes, 177 genera, and 5,878 species. Uh, you can see here that the, the New World has uh, far more major lineages than uh, either Africa or Asia. Um, and also you can see that uh, most of the tropical biodiversity hotspots, uh, so these are areas that have high levels of diversity, but also unfortunately high levels of habitat loss. Uh, these are areas that are uh, mostly pretty species rich for melastomes. Uh, that are then threatened with extinction in these areas that are rapidly degrading. So uh, the family level phylogeny here, uh, the, the classification that is most commonly cited is um, the classification of Cognot, 1891, and Renner, uh, 1993 also. Uh, so Cognot, he based his system on Triana's work and he recognized 13 tribes. Uh, Renner used uh, seven morphological characters in her early cladistic analysis of the family and she recognized just uh, nine tribes. Um, careful morphology-based and DNA-based phylogenetic analyses have indicated that these earlier classifications may not always recognize monophyletic lineages. Uh, there's a lot of morphological characters that have been emphasized, but they are homoplasious. So those would be characters like anther dimorphism, uh, anthers opening by either pores or slits, the number of pores, uh, the types of appendages and their locations, pedoconnectives, inflorescence position, floral morosity, fruit type, and uh, distribution on the globe. So I started looking at all this, uh, kind of the big picture of the family back when I was a graduate student. Um, and well, I think a lot of you know, I've been striving at this for way too long, trying to always get more, uh, more species, more genes. Uh, but anyway, here we finally are. We needed this kind of broad species sampling in order to elucidate these evolutionary lineages and to be uh, to avoid being misled by those homoplasious morphological characters. So now that we've got a tree that is pretty well sampled and pretty strongly supported in most, most cases, now we can use this to really dig into, uh, well, making a new classification, analyzing uh, character evolution, biogeography, pollination shifts, et cetera. So the sampling, uh, we've put together this uh, matrix uh, with a lot of help here, especially from Marcelo. Uh, this matrix uh, includes uh, 158 genera, 2,435 species, many of which were sampled multiple times from across their uh, sometimes broad ranges. And we have uh, nine genes, two nuclear ribosomal, the rest chlor chloroplast. And so the, the final aligned matrix was over a thousand base pairs. Uh, and then we conducted a maximum likelihood analysis uh, using RaxML8. And so the result of this is uh, we have a tree. This is a, a summary tree here uh, showing the, the tribes, the support values for the tribes uh, and their interrelationships. Uh, what we can see is that we have uh, strong support for three subfamilies uh, and all of the tribes in which we were able to sample uh, more than one species. Uh, in some cases, well, like Lithobii and uh, Rupestri, we only had one. Uh, we also were not able yet to um, sample Felicia uh, I'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, it's interesting to see the uh, the variation in the sizes of these tribes. So the, the variation, some of these tribes are very small, five of them, 
have eight or fewer species, but then some tribes are really huge. So like the Sonorilli has about 1,100 species and the Myconi has about 1,900 species. Um, it's interesting to note here that um, nine of the 21 tribes in the Melastoma toidii um, have only been revealed recently um, by DNA analysis. And these were all published uh, between 2010 and this upcoming book. Uh, less than half of all species in the family have been sequenced so far. So it's quite possible that uh, more new tribes will be discovered. Uh, furthermore, uh, in addition to all these uh, new tribes, every previously recognized tribe plus one subfamily, the Kibesioi, uh, they've been recircumscribed. So mostly either genera moving out or moving in. Uh, we should also take special note of Brazil because Brazil is amazing. Uh, with right now about uh, 1,453 species total for the country, uh, Brazil has more than twice as many species as all of Africa, and it's about equal to all of Asia. And so what you see here is that um, uh, all the, the tribes that are highlighted are tribes that occur in Brazil, and all the ones that are here in blue are tribes that are entirely or almost entirely uh, Brazilian endemic uh, lineages. So pretty amazing. But be careful because Colombia is catching up and Ecuador and Peru are pretty good too. Uh, so now uh, what we're gonna start getting into is the overview of these, uh, these major clades. Uh, again, keep in mind that what I'm gonna have time for today is just a very superficial uh, description of these, uh, these groups. So you should read the classification in its entirety, plus all the book chapters, uh, plus all these recent publications that have come out on many of these tribes uh, for a lot more details. And of course, the uh, numbers of the taxa are constantly changing. Uh, just since January, there's been uh, a couple new genera and several new species that have been published. So things progress. Uh, this is what a, a typical description in the new classification uh, paper look like. Uh, so this is the Astronae. You can see a little bit of uh, basic taxonomy here, uh, some uh, information about the distribution, the genera, the number of species, uh, a detailed description of the characteristics of the tribe, uh, the key uh, literature, uh, the key references for this uh, each tribe, and then a section, uh, the notes section, uh, which has uh, just some basic uh, discussion of interesting characteristics, uh, historical circumscriptions, biogeography, and whatever else I thought was interesting. So um, with that, let's get started. Uh, we'll start here with the Elisbioidae. Uh, this is the only major lineage in the family whose circumscription has really never changed. Uh, it's always been recognized as a good lineage, and that's because it really is super distinctive. Uh, in recent analyses, uh, the Elisbioidae has appeared as um, a basal branch in the Melastomataceae, or it forms a clade with the Cabesioidae, or it's sister to the Melastomatoidae. Uh, so it is still kind of bouncing around depending on what data is being analyzed and how. So for these reasons, it's best to include it within the Melastomataceae um, as a subfamily, rather than calling it its own family as has been done in some classifications. Uh, so some of the characteristics uh, um, for this, this group are the, uh, the foliar sclerids uh, with stomatal crypts and unicerate hairs. Uh, the foliage, they, they often look uh, more like Myrtaceae than melastomes, um, but they are actually cryptically acrodromous. Uh, if you get down really into the anatomy of these things, uh, they have axillary inflorescences, uh, the flowers are often blue. 
uh, and the anthers often have this uh, dorsal oil gland and the anthers are opening up by uh, longitudinal slits, except for Moriri. Uh, the fruit type here is a berry that has uh, just one or a few very large seeds that have very large embryos and leafy cotyledons. Uh, next up is the Cabesioidae. Uh, this, sorry, somebody's got a mic on. Uh, so the Cabesioidae, uh, this is uh, a, an old world, mostly uh, uh, Malaysian uh, genus, especially uh, diverse on the island of Borneo. Um, we're recognizing this here as a, a subfamily. Uh, just calling attention to its uh, distinctiveness and also its phylogenetic position that I was talking about a minute ago. There's no doubt that these three subfamilies are each monophyletic. It's just that we still haven't worked out exactly what their exact interrelationships are. So uh, Ternandra is instantly recognizable uh, because it has, uh, the, the species have this uh, either tessellate or echinate uh, hypanthium. Uh, which is pretty funky. Uh, the flowers are um, formaris and radially symmetrical. The, uh, the styles, uh, and the, the stigmas rather, are really strange. And this, I think, would be a great opportunity for somebody to do uh, some kind of a reproductive biology uh, study uh, because the, the stigmas are either kind of sulcate or lobed or even kind of twisted. There's something strange going on there, and I don't know what it is. Uh, the anthers are rhymos. Um, if you look at the, uh, the fruit, uh, this over here in cross-section, we can see uh, they, they have inferior ovaries with uh, four antipetalous locules and parietal placentation. And also, if you look at the young growth of Terandra, they often have uh, kind of bluish leaves. They're often kind of like this funky, like translucent color. Uh, and that's just an interesting thing. I don't know why they're doing that. Uh, you also see that in some Elizabethoidae. Uh, next up is the uh, Astronii. Uh, so this is uh, a really cool tribe that we only recently uh, came to realize is actually Amphipacific because we have Tesmanianthus in uh, the Americas, uh, which had formerly been in the Marianii, which makes sense if you look at some characters, but then if you look at other characters, it also makes perfect sense that it goes in with the Astronii and um, all of the molecular data indicate that relationship. Um, morphologically then, if you look at the presence of uh, things like megastyloids and the peltate scales, um, uh, that's, we, we see that uh, as a similarity with Astronii and its sister clade, the Henriettii. Um, Astronii also have mostly diplostemonous uh, flowers, except in uh, the monotypic genus uh, Philippine endemic Astrocalyx, which is polystaminate. Uh, they generally have rhymos anthers. Uh, except some of them may have uh, declined pores, which I don't know, I think is probably just a modification of um, the Ramos uh, opening. And only in Tesmanianthus and in Astrocalyx, we see these apically cleft anthers. Uh, I don't think that that character occurs anywhere else in the family. Uh, we also have uh, this uh, basal or basal axile placentation or basal um, ascending, like you can see here in this uh, acarianthus. And the fruits are rupturing capsules that have kind of a star-like shape, which gives uh, this whole uh, tribe its name, uh, Astronia, star-like. Oh, and one other thing about Astroni is um, I suspect that there's been uh, shifts in uh, pollinators. Uh, so if you look at most typical flowers of Astronia, kind of like this one here, and Astronidium also looks kind of like that. Um, these are most likely insect pollinated flowers, but in Bicarianthus, I suspect that there's been 
uh, shifts to uh, bird and possibly even bat pollination. Uh, Jeff Moncera, for example, has had uh, taken some photos of some uh, spider eaters uh, dipping their beaks into what looks kind of like a carianthus flower. Uh, just oddly by coincidence, Beccarianthus and Carianthus both have these similar kind of flowers. But Beccarianthus is named after Otto Beccari. Anyway, um, so Henrietta E uh, is the, the next tribe. This is going to be the this is the, the first tribe that was described during the uh, molecular era. And so these are all uh, New World uh, species, uh, shrubs and trees uh, that have megastyloids. Uh, the hairs are basally roughened or they have, uh, or they're dendritic stellate. The leaves are generally ply nerved. Uh, they have axillary inflorescences and clawed and fleshy petals. Uh, ovaries are partly to wholly inferior. They often have uh, lobed stigmas and they all have berry fruits. So these were all things that up until recently uh, were in the Myconii, uh, but now we know they don't belong there. We are keeping Kirkbridea for now in the Henrietta, but it does have some, um, some characters that make us question that. Um, so for example, uh, it has uh, these dimorphic stamens, uh, ventrally bilobed anther connective appendages, uh, and the ovary has uh, uh, strigos uh, apices. So we're hoping that Tumberto uh, or Marcella or somebody can go and uh, get this for us and we can include it in a molecular phylogeny and figure out where it belongs, possibly here or possibly melastomatae or possibly marcetii. We would really like to know. Uh, next up is the lithobii. Uh, Lithobium is a uh, monotypic genus that is restricted to these uh, quartzitic rock outcrops in Minas Gerais, uh, Brazil. Uh, these are so lithophytic rhizomatous tuberous herbs that are only apparent. They only come out of these uh, cracks in the rocks for a few months each year, and then they retreat and go dormant. Uh, they have uh, three maris, sometimes four maris, solitary flowers on, on long pedicels, uniporous anthers, uh, three locular half inferior ovary, capsular fruits, and uh, numerous ovoid seeds. Uh, this genus has been kicked around. It's uh, historically been included in uh, the Sonorilli, the uh, Lavoisieri, the Bertolonii, and even now, uh, we are putting it uh, near the, the base of the Melastomatoidae, uh, just above the uh, Stroni plus Henrietta clade. But in other analyses, it pops up in different positions within the family, but it never goes inside of any other clade. It's always just floating around by itself. So we're pretty confident that it is uh, its own distinct lineage. Uh, next up is the Myconii, which, well, we've all heard a lot about the Myconii in recent years. Uh, so this tribe, uh, you probably know, historically had something around 30 genera. Many of those have been kicked out into the Cyphostyle, into the Henrietti, uh, into what's now the Pixidanthi, uh, and then all the remaining genera, uh, over 20, uh, have now been uh, put into synonymy under uh, a broad myconia. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the history of that here. You've heard it all before. Uh, it's hard to really think of what the actual synapomorphies are for uh, this, this tribe uh, because it's big and there's a lot of variation in the characters that we do find here. They do all have berries as the fruit. And they just about all have uh, numerous pyramidal seeds. Um, they mostly have poros anthers. Uh, however, rhymos anthers uh, apparently have evolved independently more than once. Uh, inflorescence position is variable. Uh, they generally have calyx teeth. They're generally diplostemonous, but we do have examples of polystaminate species like the former conostigia. And we also have haplostemonous species. So, it's kind of all over the place. 
Uh, next up is the Ariachnomy. Uh, this is a small tribe, mostly restricted to uh, Brazil, uh, to the Atlantic forests, uh, except for Octephalus, uh, which is the one in the illustration there, uh, that occurs on uh, Mount Ayangana, a uh, sandstone tapui in the Paparaima Mountains of Western Guyana. Um, it's a small tribe, but the, the characters are pretty variable. This is kind of a, a phenomenon that we see over and over again, that even in some of these pretty small tribes, it's hard to really think of consistent, stable characters. Um, what we do have here, though, is that they are uh, radican herbs or rhizomatous subshrubs or shrubs uh, with long calyx teeth, uh, white petals, uh, uniporos anthers, and capsular fruits. Uh, next up is the Mariani. Uh, this is a neotropical tribe, super interesting, uh, especially in terms of the pollination biology, which uh, we've all learned a lot about in the last eight or so years. Thank you, Agnes. <laughs> uh, this tribe still has a lot of work that we need to do on it, though. Uh, these genera are not necessarily all monophyletic. At this point, uh, for example, Axinea is extremely intimately related to Mariania, but then some species of Mariania apparently go elsewhere. Macrocentrum is a bit of a mess. Um, it's a really interesting genus uh, of tribe. Uh, we have some genera that are small herbs, so things like Salpinga uh, and Macrocentrum and Maguireanthus that had formerly been uh, closely associated with uh, Bertolonia for good reasons, they look a lot alike. Uh, and then all the rest of them are shrubs and trees and, and climbers. Uh, so some of the characters that we can say that they generally share uh, are uh, dorsal but not ventral anther connective appendages, uniporos anthers, uh, and capsular fruits. And in most cases, they do have uh, these clavate uh, seeds that are um, that have generally pretty sharp angles on them longitudinally, except for all those Bertolonioid types um, uh, genera, which have this Bertolonioid, Bertolonioid uh, type seed. So very interesting. A lot of diversity here. Uh, next is the Bertolonia, Bertoloni E. Um, so this is a South American tribe uh, with about 35 uh, species in the genus Bertolonia. Uh, now that uh, the tribe has been narrowed, and uh, these are uh, pretty much restricted to the Atlantic uh, forest of Brazil. Uh, although we've got two oddballs in Venezuela, which I'm not sure if those have been sequenced yet. Uh, it would be interesting to know for sure if they go in Bertolonia or not. But these are um, herbs and subshrubs with anisomerous five-maris flowers, white to pink petals, uh, scorpioid, circinate cymes, and costate hypanthia, usually. Uh, they have these ob triquetus uh, winged capsules. And then here again is this, uh, this seed form that we see repeated uh, here and, and elsewhere, where we have on the anti rafal side of the seed, uh, papillae to um, these um, tuberculae. Uh, next up is the triolini. Uh, this is a newly described a uh, tribe that includes just Monolina and Triolina. They'd formerly been closely associated with Bertolonia, um, but they are distinct. Uh, so these are uh, herbs or subfrutescents. Uh, they're often anisophilus, strongly anisophilus. So you can see here, uh, this is a Monolina. Here's this uh, tuber that you often see. And sometimes uh, if you look uh, closely down here, you can find a tiny little leaflet, which I think is kind of the vestigial uh, leaflet uh, that would have been opposite the big leaf. Uh, so these, again, we have scorpioid cymes and isomerous five maris flowers with a three-locular ovary. 
Uh, the stamens here are often dimorphic and uni uniporous anthers uh, with one to three ventral appendages and pedoconnectives. If you look here at the, the style, it's very interesting. Uh, here is a, a monolena, and you can see here the style is basally um, constricted. And then you get about halfway up or so, and then you get into this big inflated part. And then finally, you have a, a capitate stigma. So that's kind of strange. Um, and again, like in Bertolonia, we see these uh, trichetis uh, capsules, and again, this kind of Bertolonioid type seed. Uh, next is Stan Markii. Uh, this is um, uh, a new tribe that has uh, just two genera and four species. Uh, Stan Markia is found in Mexico and Guatemala, Centro de Niastrum, in the Andes of uh, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Um, these flowers are, uh, once again, we have this pattern of anisomerous five maris flowers of three locular ovaries. Uh, the, the petioles tend to be quite long, and the, the leaf shape uh, is elliptic ovate and uh, with uh, chordate bases. And again, we see this bertolonioid type seed. Uh, however, here we have a, a very expanded wraith. Uh, and this seed morphology led uh, Almeida to surmise when he was describing Stanmarchia that it would be closely related to Centro Deniastrum. And we don't have great sequence for this yet, but we will soon. Uh, but what we do have does pair these things. Uh, next is what we now have to call the Pixidanthii, formerly the tribe known as Blakey. Uh, we've got uh, several examples uh, in the new classification of very old, very rarely used names that we now must um, resurrect because they were validly published and just overlooked. So this is one of those. So now I'm trying to get used to calling this the Pixidanthii. Uh, of course, this is the best tribe, the most fascinating tribe. Uh, we have here uh, six maris, perfect flowers, with axillary inflorescences, isomorphic stamens, generally biporous anthers, and we have a dorsal appendage, but not ventral ones. Uh, just two genera now in this tribe, Blakia and Chalibea, uh, with Blakia having these solitary or fasciculate flowers, each one uh, subtended by a uh, two pairs of bracts, and Chalibea has uh, usually long pedunculate uh, inflorescences uh, that are simple or compound signs, and each flower subtended by a single pair of bracts. They all have uh, berry fruits. We very commonly find in this tribe the presence of uh, acarodomatia uh, and sometimes uh, formicaria. And uh, we also have pyramidal to ovoid seeds that are smooth or have very little uh, or ornamentation. Uh, next is the Cyphostyle. Uh, it was originally described by Gleason in 29, but uh, then it was later kind of put into the Myconi for a while until uh, it got kicked back out. Uh, this is a neotropical, uh, uh, actually South American tribe of uh, suffrutescent herbs, shrubs, and treelets that are all haplostemonous. And they also have uh, these really interesting uh, recurve styles. And they also have uh, partly to wholly inferior ovaries, but then they have capsular fruits. And that's kind of a, a strange combination. And then in alloneuron, uh, we have pinnate venation. Next is the Sonorilli. Uh, this is a very interesting tribe. It is a very large tribe, very diverse. Uh, we now know that this tribe is pantropical. Uh, so we now know that we have these uh, six small genera that are found in Northern South America that are mostly, or all of them, uh, basal in the tribe. So this is really interesting. Uh, this is kind of a, a frustrating tribe, though. 
uh, because almost every character you look at is really diverse. There's like almost nothing that is stable here. Uh, the, the habits, we have everything from uh, very small herbs uh, to larger herbs, lots of shrubs and tree lits, some trees, lots of climbers, especially metanilla and related genera. Uh, some of these are ant plants. Uh, one thing that we can say is that in terms of the, uh, the old world species are uh, isomerous and the new world species are anisomerous uh, with the only exceptions there being uh, calvoa and trisophyton that kind of flip that pattern. They're pretty much all diplostaminous. That's the majority of them, but not all of them because we have some that are polystaminate and some that are haplostaminous. Uh, they do all have poros anthers, mostly uniporos, but sometimes biporos. Um, there's a lot of capsules, but then we have berry fruits and metanilla and allied genera. The seeds are kind of all over the place, lots of diversity there. Um, so this tribe, there's really a lot that I could say about this. I'm going to try not to. Uh, I wrote more about this tribe by far than any other uh, tribe in, in the new classification chapter. Um, what the old world lacks in the overall diversity of lineage, it certainly makes up for in just the amazing diversity of the Sonorilli. Unlike what the situation was that we saw in the Myconi with lots of genera that all got united into a larger Myconi, Myconia, that's not what's gonna happen here. Um, there could be some of that, but I think um, it's more likely that uh, lots of new genera are gonna have to get split out. Uh, we still have huge problems with the circumscription of these genera and with synonymy. Uh, so some things are probably going to um, get expanded and others reduced. I'll leave it there. Uh, Pirami, uh, this is uh, a tribe that was recently um, described as Cambesidesi, but actually Pirami was uh, described earlier. Uh, so this again, we don't have great consistent suites of synapomorphic characters, but we do generally find here that the flowers are uh, four to seven maris. Uh, in most cases, the petals are monochromatic, but uh, Cambesidesia is really cool because it usually has these bicolored yellow and orange uh, petals. Uh, the stamens lack uh, pedoconnectives and ventral appendages, and the dorsal connective appendages can be present or absent. When they're present, they can be actually, in some cases, quite long. Uh, and these have capsular fruits. Uh, now we have the Disokiti, uh, which has uh, thankfully recently been worked up by um, Karta Nagoro. Uh, he's revised all of these. And so now we have uh, a good idea about what uh, these genera really are. Uh, Metanilla and allied genera had formerly been closely associated with this group, but now we know that's just, uh, again, we have homoplasia's characters, superficial similarities that make them look similar. They were put together, but they should not be. So Disokiti, they're mostly root climbers, um, although in pseudo uh, those are mostly shrubby, terrestrial. Uh, they all have four maris flowers. Uh, the andresium, we can have uh, eight stamens, or we could have four stamens and four staminodes, or we could have just four stamens. The staminodes can be either uh, antipetalous or antisepalous. The anther uh, appendages are both dorsal and ventral and have all different kinds of forms. A lot of really funky things going on with the appendages here. Uh, they all have four locular inferior ovaries and berry fruits. And you can kind of see in this picture here, uh, these pockets. So they have uh, extra ovarial chambers. And so what this means is that the ovary is kind of fused by longitudinal flanges of tissue to the interior um, wall of the hypantheum. And the anthers in bud are set down into those pockets. Uh, that's an unusual character. 
Uh, and then also, if you look at the, the stems, uh, they often have interpetiolar ridges or these big lobes that are essentially stipules. Uh, Dinophory, uh, this is a tribe that we're uh, recognizing in the new classification. Uh, this is so far the only new tribe uh, that is restricted to the old world. Uh, and again, this is one of those things where, okay, we've got this tribe, but it's kind of hard to, um, to figure out like what are really the good uniting characters for this. Uh, we do have, as far as we know, a chromosome number of n equals 12. These are shrubs. Uh, they have subequal to unequal leaves, serrate to dentate margins, pink to purple petals, and really diverse stamen morphology. Uh, next is the Rexii. Uh, so this is a really nice tribe. Uh, this is the only one that I actually have easy access to. Uh, here in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, we actually have eight species of Rexia uh, nearby here. Uh, so uh, they all have uh, formaris flowers. We often have um, a, a constricted hypantheum. Uh, they all have four locular and superior ovaries that will make a capsular fruit uh, that usually are um, ursulate. Uh, the anthers are eudiporos, and they mostly have a little dorsal uh, appendage. And their seeds are really distinctive. So here we have uh, cochleate uh, costate seeds with tuberculate uh, testas. And Rexia, I'll just say, is uh, a very interesting genus in, in the family. Uh, because its distribution, it's almost entirely limited to the uh, eastern North America, uh, except for one, uh, Rexia cubensis, that gets down into the Caribbean. And also Rexia virginica is uh, distributed farther from the equator than any other mellowstone. Uh, and it grows as far north as Ontario and Nova Scotia in Canada, uh, which is about 45 degrees north. Uh, next is the, what we're now calling the Lavoisierii, uh, formerly known as the Microlissii. Uh, so this uh, tribe is uh, almost endemic to Brazil, uh, especially diverse in Campo Rupestre and uh, Cejado habitats. Uh, these are uh, mostly uh, shrubs and uh, they often have ericoid leaves uh, uniporos, often rostrate anthers. Uh, the dorsal anther connective appendages are absent. Pedoconnectives are usually present. And they have capsular fruits and uh, these seeds that are reniform to elongate. And they have a foveolate to lacunate reticulate testa. Uh, so uh, Versian et al. Uh, recently synonymized a bunch of these genera, uh, so Chitostoma, Lavoisiera, Stenodon, and Tremblea, uh, into a broadened Microlysia. Uh, this approach is certainly supported by uh, lots of homoplasious morphological characters, uh, but I'm just kind of awaiting uh, kind of a greater phylogenomic uh, investigations to provide more resolution here. Because one thing that's really notable about this whole tribe, this radiation, is that they have very, very, very short uh, branch lengths. So no offense to anybody. Uh, Marcetti, uh, another recently uh, described tribe. Um, almost everything here was formally included uh, in the Tibuccini. Uh, most of these are Brazilian. And it's very interesting in terms of the habit here. The, um, the habit of annual herbs is something very rare uh, in the Melastomataceae. And almost all annual herbs in the family are found in this tribe. Uh, so uh, these are uh, terrestrial herbs to shrubs with very diverse stamen morphology, but they do um, have uniporos and rostrate anthers. Uh, the ovary is two to four locular and half to entirely superior. Uh, they have ribbed capsules 
and uh, seeds that have a little bit of diversity to them, but um, the, uh, the, the testa uh, is often areolate or, or foveolate. Uh, then we'll get to the uh, rupestri. Uh, so this is uh, another new tribe uh, that is restricted to, uh, the, uh, to Bahia, uh, Brazil. Uh, only two species that were formerly uh, called myconias uh, but they certainly don't belong there. Uh, so here we have uh, anisomerous five merits flowers with three locular ovaries. Again, uh, the flowers have long pedicels and uh, purple to lilac uh, petals, uh, long calyx lobes, and uniporos uh, anthers with pedoconnectives and uh, two ventral appendages. Uh, it's also really interesting, these, these capsules appear to be indehiscent, and in their locules, uh, each locule has just a single large seed, and that seed actually has a septum going through it. So these are really weird characters. Uh, next is the melastomate. Uh, we're taking here a uh, broad uh, concept of this, uh, the, the New World ones historically were all called Tibuchini, the Old World ones, Osbeki. Uh, but because of the phylogenetic position of uh, Loricolepis, Terolepis, and Terogastra, which appear to be basal to everything else, but there's some flipping around, it's still not totally stable. Uh, we're just going to take the, uh, the expansive view. And you can recognize subtribes here if, if you really wanted to, uh, New World and Old World. Uh, so, let's see, what's interesting here? We have, uh, in this tribe, we have uh, uniporos anthers with pedoconnectives and paired ventral appendages on either one or both staminal whorls, uh, half to fully superior ovaries that are generally crowned with some form of trichomes. Most of these have capsules. Some of them have berries and some of them have rupturing capsules like this melastoma here. Uh, also, their seeds are fairly diagnostic. Um, they have these coculate and tuberculate seeds. And there is a chromosomal character here where in the new world, uh, they are usually X equals nine or 18 and in the old world, usually X equals 10. Uh, finally, we get to the Felicia Dami. Uh, this, uh, this tribe has just one species, uh, Felicidamia stenocarpa, uh, that up until uh, very recently was known only from the type collection uh, that was made in the, the late 1940s. And it's really a weird thing. Uh, there's just nothing else like this in the family. Uh, so uh, Jacques Felice was totally justified in thinking that this was uh, a monotypic tribe. Uh, so some of the characters that we see here are these uh, very long petioles. Oh, so I should mention that this, what we're looking at here on the left, uh, is a recent collection. So it was rediscovered um, just several years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, Marie Claire now has this and is going to have some DNA sequences of it within the next I don't know, a few weeks, month or two, something like that, and the seeds also. So very soon we'll be able to, to test whether or not this actually is a uh, unique lineage. If it isn't, the only thing that I can think of is that maybe it would go into the Sonorilli because that tribe is already just really wacky and where else would this go if not by itself? Uh, so this has uh, these terminal inflorescences uh, that have just a few flowers. And what's really strange about this is the ovary. Uh, so they have this very elongate, very narrow ovary uh, that is quite reminiscent of something uh, in the Onagraceae, so something like Enothera. Um, also, if you look here at the placenta, so here is a, a, an illustration from the protologue, uh, you have this angular and sinuous placenta. So here you can see that. And the ovules just kind of, they're pendulous. They're hanging off of these, these angles on that placenta. Very strange. 
Uh, also, if you look at the, uh, the Andresium, uh, it's dimorphic. And in the larger series, uh, it, the anther is rostrate. It has uh, two dorsal appendages and one ventral appendage and also a little pedoconnective there. So it's really an oddball. Uh, so that's the classification. Uh, where do we go from here? Hopefully we will uh, continue getting lots more sequences, lots more species. Hopefully we'll get more resolution uh, and more support for all of these tribes. Who knows, maybe some more. Uh, I think when we get uh, broader sampling, we'll be able to uh, learn more about uh, the actual generic circumscriptions and their interrelationships. Uh, I would really like to uh, get more information about the anatomy of the family. Um, you know, there hasn't been any really great uh, recent, very recent uh, anatomical surveys of the family, not really since uh, the 1980s. But it would be great to, to get back into that and then to be able to contextualize the anatomical characters with the molecular phylogeny, because I think that many of these anatomical characters probably have a greater phylogenetic signal in them than many of the other characters that have historically been used, because the thought is that they are, uh, they're under less like ecological, ecological or external pressure to change. Uh, than things like, for instance, flowers. Uh, if anybody is interested in getting into something like that, I have a big collection, a spirit collection that would be great uh, to, to, well, to, to share with you. Um, I think also as systematists, um, the applied side of our work, uh, you know, we should try to uh, assess the extinction risk. Uh, for all the melastome species and then share that information with uh, organizations and policymakers in order to protect these plants uh, and the habitats that they live in while we still can. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm always looking for, for students. If you're interested in working with me, uh, please reach out and let's talk. And uh, with that, thank you very much for all of your time and attention. All I have to say is, wow, <laughs> um, a lot, a lot, a lot, and beautiful pictures and very well illustrated. Awesome. Well, thank you um, for your pictures. I used a lot of yours. Well, and everybody's. <laughs> so uh, I know there are questions. And, and if you're shy and don't want to speak up, you can um, put them on the chat and, and one of us will read them. So um, anybody wants to go first? I have questions for sure, if I can start. <laughs> Go ahead. Yay. Thank you, Darren. That was awesome. I am uh, shocked that I now have to learn a lot of new, like many new tribes. <laughs> you guys have been very productive in renaming things and naming new things. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are many things that, that you mentioned that were crazy. But one thing that caught me, like in the beginning, you said for multiple Tribes, and you don't really have any good synapomorphies for those. Do you have any idea as to why? Are you looking at traits that are under very different selection pressures, and this is why they go wild? Or, yeah, any, any thoughts on why this is happening? I just find it very striking. I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> it is just kind of a strange recurring phenomenon here. Many of these tribes are just very diverse and have a lot of uh, liability in the, uh, these morphological characters. So this is one thing where, you know, hopefully we could get more anatomical information. You know, most of the anatomical details that, um, that I put into the classification chapter are things that I just had to dig out of the old literature, you know, back to uh, the Dutch people uh, back in the 80s, uh, back farther to people like uh, Van Tegum uh, in the 1800s. Um, there's really, I think, there's a, a great number of anatomical characters that we can use, but 
most of the taxa that we would really like to have, they haven't been sampled. So I think that is going to be uh, an important area to get into. Cool. Thank you. If I if I may add to this, in in, in general, I mean, I think that many, if, if you know, somebody gives you any plant that you've never seen, you probably can put it to tribe. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, based on this new classification, is just because they will have all, most or all, all the characters that the, the tribes have. But in every tribe, there's something that one oddball, and it's not that. The tribes are not supported by anything. It's like almost all the taxa. So, like, you know, in in uh, for example, Henrietti, they are almost always um, Carolina inflorescences. Well, there are two species that are not. Or if you go to Myconi, they almost never have Carolina inflorescences. Well, there's about five out of 1900 that have it. So, mm -hmm. so it's it's not. I, I think that. The characters are there, but then, the, the, but you know, you know, we, we don't seem to have those issues when we talk about legless lizards or snakes, and and you know, we, we know that these things are tetrapods still, and there are vestiges there. Those things. Um, the, same, the the same thing goes with the seeds. I want to say, you know, like I'm looking here at that picture of the the rexia, uh, the rexia e seed. You know, it's very characteristic. If you look at a seed that looks like that one that I showed you before. It's got to be Rexy. But then there's uh, there's uh, one or two species that have a completely different seed. The same thing like in, in Monoketum. They have a very distinctive seed, but then not all of them. Or like in general, you look at the Melostomatae, and I told you that they all have that coculate uh, tuberculate seed. But then you like go go look up the seeds of um, Centrodenia or Dicutanthera. And they're just wacko. They're totally different. Centrodenia, especially. There's nothing else like it in, in the family. So um, what, one question is like that comes up usually in this big analysis is uh, if you know time and money is limited. So what do you think is better? More taxa and uh, fewer loci, fewer characters, or or do you want fewer taxa but more loci, more characters? Uh, personally, I guess I would probably go for more taxa. Um, the reason being that a lot of what we're seeing now from the phylogenomic studies is really just confirming what we already found using just you know a few loci. So I think that we would probably learn more by getting more taxa than by getting more genes. But we need those more genes too, because well, theoretically anyway, uh, we're gonna get better support values and eh, we'll see. <laughs> Lucas, what do you think? <laughs> it's a tough question, right? It's hard to tell, but I agree with you. We need we need more food work for sure. Yeah, there's still, there, there, let me just say one uh, other thing quickly. There's still about uh, 20 genera that have never been sequenced. And and those are real geographically where? <laughs> um I guess most of them are in uh, the Flora Melisiana region, Louisiana. Mostly in the Sonorilli. So from, from your initial um, tree here, looking at Sonorilli, and I know this is not a Sonorilli analysis, but Medinilla particularly, and it seems to even be in different tribes because there were things that were medinillas that are now in this in uh in the this disokiti what, what do you think is happening there uh homoplasy so if you look superficially at uh uh medinilla and it's related 
so the, the allied genera, and you look at what's now Disokides, Sensu Stricto, yeah, superficially, they do look very similar. It makes perfect sense. You know, they're in the, the same regions. They have similar habits. They have similar flowers. They have berry fruits. Uh, you know, it, it's no surprise that they were historically uh, considered to be close. Um, but I have, a, I have a question here from Jeff. Oh, OK. Um, so he's asking, well, he's thanking for the, for the bird eye view of the family. And then he's asking if you're going to prioritize around three to five specific organs for anatomical surveys, what do you think will give the best phylogenetic signal or what, or what would you focus on? Um, let's see. Seeds would probably be the first thing. Um, and then anatomical characters. Okay, that's not easy to get at, but I think that there's going to be more consistent true phylogenetic signal in anatomical characters than in pretty much anything else that you can easily observe, unfortunately. Everything else is just so labile in this family. Are you thinking like venation patterns or inner vascular bundles of leaves or petioles? Or anything. <laughs> anything that we can get our hands on. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of uh, PTO sections then. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. If, I think a lot of the characters that we would like to get at, you could probably do, you know, fairly rough dissections, although, you know, more careful dissections and really careful anatomical surveys like have been done previously. That's really what we need. With targeted uh, sampling, you know, we, I've got a, a nice spreadsheet showing like everything that's ever been looked at anatomically. Uh, so I could say exactly like, you know, what are the characters that seem to be relatively stable in each group? And then what species should really be targeted? Where are the gaps? So if anybody is interested in this, let's talk. <laughs> well, I think that's, a, that's been a great summary. Um, we're a little bit past 11. So in, in interest of time, people will, um, in, unless anybody has any quick question, but I don't see any others. Okay, so th thank you, Darren, uh, a lot. Uh, this will be again on, uh, we'll, post this uh, the recording in the next couple of days. And um, uh, congratulations for this and look out for the book. Uh, we're still on, on track for um, uh, early July coming out of the book. Uh, that's what Springer has been telling us all along and, and they seem to be uh, on schedule. So thank you very much and uh, see you all soon and, and pay attention to the next seminars. Um, that will be coming up. Thank you. Thank you so much.